All right, I want to teach just a little bit this morning, and uh, then we want to uh, be able to bless the Bates. I do want to make mention, though, uh, and I'm sorry because I am absolutely uh, paralyzed when it comes to remembering names, but I know both Brad and Sherry have parents and family members that are here today, and so we want to give you a special welcome. We're so glad that you've come today, and, and we honor you, bless you. Thanks for, thanks for being with us. I know some of you traveled a good distance uh, to be here, so we appreciate that very much. Hey, we've been in what we've called an all-access series, and uh, we've been preaching it up in the snowy northwest parts of Indiana, and you've been hearing it here as well. And we just believe that 2016 is a new year that's full of new possibilities and promise. Come on, talk to me or I'm going to yell at you, all right? Come on, say amen. Amen. Come on, we're full gospel, which means we're noisy. And uh, we believe that we can access the possibilities, the promises of God. I don't want to live a rerun. How many of you know reruns? If you're, if you're an actor in a rerun, you get residuals. But if you're just a normal human being and you're living a rerun life, there are no residuals. I don't want to live a repeat. For some of you, you would say... 2015 was was challenging and I don't want to repeat on that one Can I get an amen from a few of you on that? I don't want to repeat that some of you said well, you know I'd actually had a pretty good 2015. Well, here's the good news. God always eclipses himself So 2016 can be even greater And so we want his plan. We want his purpose his promise his provision In other words, we want to see his kingdom come So if we seek first his kingdom Matthew 6.33 says that everything else is taken care of. In fact, God will do exceedingly abundantly more than you and I could think. And so uh, I know Mike Ware, Pastor Mike Ware, if you were here, preached on the double. Did you hear the double? Wouldn't you like God to double some things in your life? I would. I remember hearing that message the first time. In fact, I don't know what he did here, um, uh, but he handed out these juicy fruit things with double men on it. Double. I carried around that pack of double mint gum, reminding me God is the God of the double. And uh, we can also affirm that this kingdom's supernatural, amen? And I got a great report from many of you about last week in the fire line and, and Pastor Brad teaching on the supernatural. And we believe in a supernatural God, right? I guarantee if you have a need like Chris Kelly has, And of course, he's always believed that God was supernatural, but that'll change your theology right there. So this is what we're talking about, accessing all of these things, living in the presence, power, and promise. You know, when I was a a staff pastor years ago, and many of you have heard these stories, um, we had a, a large building and we were able to facilitate great conferences and events. In fact, there was a time period in the early 90s through the mid 90s that anybody who was anybody in ministry that came through uh, northern South Carolina, they would stop at Evangel Cathedral and they held a meeting there because it would seat at the time it was the largest sanctuary in the state, some 6,000 people. And uh, we hosted one time Benny Hinn and no matter what you think of Benny Hinn at the time, Uh, That ministry was on the front end of its trajectory of just becoming notable, popular. And we were the last church that he stopped at before he had to go to the great civic arenas. And so we're talking 10,000 people showed up in order to uh, participate in those meetings in a a venue that only would hold about 6,000 people. And so we had to send 2,000 down to the old campus and microwave, you know, the signal back. is That's probably not the, you see how techy I am, just microwave that signal down the road in, in order to facilitate it all. But I mean, the, the security and the way they handled it was such that each of us had to have one of these lanyards like you see on the screen that gave us access, even in our own church, because they were renting the church and, and, and it was like a conference center and we had to have one of these all access type passes. Now, hear me when I say this, Uh, I was on staff there. In in the grand scheme of things, I was a big nobody. But I got one of those all-access passes. And you know why I got one of those all-access passes? Because I was working it. 
In other words, I, I was a part of a team of which we all had all access passes that were serving it, working it, doing what needed to be done. We, we didn't even really get to sit in the meetings. We were just working around the meeting in order to facilitate all those that were coming with these needs. And so I started to think about that and it sort of brings us to really an important subject today as we continue all of this. And I'm going to be reading out of Matthew 25. So quickly run to Matthew 25. We're going to read a parable here. And uh, our title this morning is Service, the Culture of the Kingdom. Service, the Culture of the Kingdom. You see, if you're going to get an all-access pass in the kingdom, you're going to have to come to terms with what it means to serve. And so today I just want to explore that. In fact, I want to explore it in a little bit different way because I think a lot of us know that servanthood is a part of being a Christian. But let's read this parable in Matthew 25. It's lengthy, but you know it. Bear with me. I'll read it quickly. Jesus speaks saying, For the kingdom of heaven... So he's talking about the kingdom. He's talking about the rule of God is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I've gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And then we run into a problem. Verse 24. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I've not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore, listen, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. We ought, we ought to preach a message entitled, God's Not Fair. Verse 29, for to everyone who has more will be given. And he will have abundance, but from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Serving the culture of the kingdom. Now it's no secret that serving is a kingdom theme. You'll read it all through the Bible. In fact, Jesus himself says that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. And literally from cover to cover, or if you're in technology, from Genesis to Revelation, you're going to see the serving theme come up again and again and again. And that's no surprise to you. I'm not preaching some surprise to anybody who's listening today. You know, serving in the context of Christianity and the kingdom, serving is really a selfless act of helping or assisting somebody else. Now, Jesus is the ultimate servant. He is the illustration of the ultimate serving ability. And it was he who gave his life in order what? To assist us in getting to God. So the kingdom is implemented and it is advanced by serving. Everyone say serving. serving. Why don't you just say, I'm called to be a servant. 
Listen, if you're saying, well, I'm not called, I'm not, listen, people use that phrase, I'm not called to, listen, you are called to be a servant. Now, now we may talk about what gets filled in the blank, but you're called to be a servant. That's everybody's calling. So the kingdom is advanced by serving. So let's review the kingdom. On the screen overhead, you'll see that the kingdom means the rule or the reign of God. The rule or the reign of God. In fact, the kingdom literally is derived from the phrase, uh, the king's dominion. So the king's dominion is the kingdom. Wherever God rules, wherever God reigns, there his kingdom exists. So if he reigns in your heart, there is his kingdom. If God reigns when you're ministering to somebody and they're healed or demons are cast out, his kingdom has come. If your house is in order and you're, you're, you're living uh, in, obediently to the Lord and, and your heart's towards the Lord, his kingdom is manifesting. His, his kingdom is not somewhere you go. His kingdom is his rule which wants to come. That's why you were taught to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where? On as it is in Say it again, on as it is in. So we're literally praying and believing his reign begins to manifest among us. Good things happen when you choose to serve. This is what the parable says. These guys were serving. We'll, we'll, we'll dissect this. But this is what Jesus says. The ones that he affirms, this is what he says. For everyone who has will be given more. That's a good promise, isn't it? It means you can serve, and as you're serving, Jesus says, good things will come to you. Because even though you're getting blessed because of your servanthood, even more can come to you. Now, I want to take a minute and just sort of contrast what kingdom culture is all about and what carnal culture is about. So I, I put kingdom culture versus carnal culture. You know, there's a difference between a guy like Hudson Taylor who gave his life to go to, what was it, uh, uh, China in order to open orphanages and literally lay his life down, his family members dying around him, but he's giving his life in order to reach China. How many of you know there's a little bit of difference between a Hudson Taylor and a Donald Trump? How many of you know that we can talk about William Carey who went to India? giving his life, losing family members in order to reach those dear Indian people. And there's a difference between how, how a William Carey serves and how any politician that I could name may serve. You, you're following me. These are two different cultures that are at work. A kingdom culture versus a carnal culture. For example, a kingdom culture is selfless. Things... things are motivated out of selflessness. A carnal culture is motivated out of selfishness. In other words, the kingdom is what can I do? A carnal culture is what can I get? You understand when Paul talked to a carnal church, the carnal church was saying, what do I get? What do I get? What do I get? What do I get? It's the American church today. What do I get? If I'm not getting something out of this, then why am I even here? Do you understand? That's carnal. Carnal, original sin, inbred sin is literally man turned into himself. If you want to know what the irreducible residue of sin in a person's life is, very simply defined, it's when you're consumed with yourself. Why do people do what they do? Why do people, why do people go get drunk and addicted and they have affairs and, 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 and they steal and they lie and they cheat? And, and we can codify all the different sins, but if you boil all the different sins down to just one irreducible residue, the bottom line is this, I want it my way. That's it. As soon as a baby is born out of its mother's womb, the first thing that comes out of its mouth are usually cries and screams being interpreted, meaning, everybody move for me. Put a blanket on me. Feed me. Take those lights out of my eyes. You're not moving fast enough. I'm going to squeal until you get it done right. Can anybody say amen to that? What's manifest? That's the carnal nature. We just get older and we just get more refined at it. We still whine and cry. It just sounds different than when we're a baby. 
But these are the differences in these two cultures. The kingdom culture is to give all you can. A carnal culture is to get all you can. A kingdom culture has an eye towards God. A carnal culture has an eye towards man. A kingdom culture is God-pleasing. A carnal culture is self-gratifying. A kingdom culture has no required return. We give because we give. We just have a heart to give. A carnal culture is you owe me. A kingdom culture has pure motive. A carnal culture has ulterior motive. I could go on and on and on and back and forth and back and forth, but here's the deal. The kingdom is an upside down kingdom in as much as a world template. Jesus doesn't do it the way the world does it. He says the first shall be last and the last shall be first and he who serves will be the greatest of all. You see, you'll never understand God's reign. You'll never understand God's rule. You'll never get into the miraculous. You'll never see the Lord move until you get this point. It is not about you. Even when we're praying for Chris and they're on the road and I, I want, I so want Chris to be healed and I believe Chris knows this because I got to visit with him in the hall. But hear me, God doesn't want to heal Chris for Chris's sake. God will heal Chris in order to make the name of Jesus great. That's why I want healing. Not for me. Kill me. I'm ready to go home now. I just soon some days go on home. But heal me in order that your name may be made great in me. You understand? That's what this is about. We don't get delivered just because your life is inconvenient. Do you understand? I'm not saying the Lord's not compassionate. You could misunderstand this. But I'm not saying that he doesn't want you to be set free because his heart's towards you and he, and, and, he, and he wants to bring order to your life and he wants things to be peaceful. I'm not saying that that isn't in the grand design of the Lord. But the Lord doesn't move. See, this is our problem. We think the Lord is up there working for our convenience. Oh, they're being inconvenienced. They need a miracle. Oh, my. He, he looks at the God. Oh, my Lord, Jesus. Oh, oh me, Jesus. Can you believe it? They're having a hard time. I must move for them. That's not it at all. That, that is so me-centered. God, you got to do this for me. That's me-centered. You, know you know what a better prayer would be if you would learn to pray this? Lord, <laughs> I will face adversity. I will face whatever's before me because my steps are ordered and you are with me and it's all going to be okay. And ultimately, I get to be with you eternally. And if you choose to heal me, deliver me, prosper me, release me, whatever it is you're wanting to do, you do it to make your name great. Because it's not about me. It's not about me. It's about you. I believe if the American church could get praying that way, I believe we'd see some amazing things. Serving is the culture of the kingdom. But there's a key even to service. I believe I put it on the screen overhead. The kingdom is not just recognized by its service, but by its faithful service. That's what Jesus said. He didn't say, you know, well done, you know, thy gifted and servant. He didn't say that. He said, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And I started to ask myself, what does it mean to be faithful? We all know we should serve, but what does it mean to be a faithful servant? Now, if I ask that, and we took a count today, and this is a rhetorical question, so don't raise your hand, okay? But if I were to say today, everybody raise their hands who would consider themselves to be faithful, and I'll let you define it yourself. I'm curious as to how many hands would be raised. I wonder if all of our hands would go up, because we will define it in our own grid. It's kind of like, am I a good person? Does anyone here not think they're a good person? Most of us think we're good people. You know, if we're not Adolf Hitler, then I'm a good person. So that's our filter. So I wonder if we just asked ourselves if we were faithful, if, if we'd have numerous hands or not. I, 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 I just wonder, I just wonder if there's a, a metric. I wonder if there's a list. I wonder if there's something we can get our minds wrapped around as to what it means to be faithful. Well, I'm going to suggest that we better understand that because I put it on the screen overhead. There will be a day of reckoning. 
That's what the parable teaches us. When we will see that diligence is rewarded or faithfulness is rewarded and negligence is punished. Now, that's pretty serious, isn't it? So it'd really be important for us to understand what this is all about. The kingdom and anything associated with the kingdom is handled, maintained, and established by servants who are faithful. The Lord does not say, well done, thou good and gifted servant. He does not say, well done, thou good and anointed servant. He does not say, well done, thou good and relevant servant. He does not say, well done, thou good and talented servant. Are you following me? He says, you gotta be what? Faithful. Say it again. Faithful. faithful. Do we understand what faithful is? And before I give you this list that I want to go through, just a couple side thoughts on this passage. The first thing I noticed in this passage was, is that they were nameless. They just didn't see any names written here. It just said there are three servants. They were nameless. I took that to mean maybe they were behind the scenes. Maybe they were in obscurity. Maybe they weren't visible. Maybe they weren't celebrities. But there were no names here. They were just... They were just People, nameless. And I guess I took great hope in that because you know what? Some days I feel nameless and obscure. I bet you do too. And isn't it good to know that it doesn't matter if you feel obscure or you feel alone or, or you feel like no one knows your name? How many of you know God gets things to you and he takes note? The second thing I noticed was is that all of them, as we begin to deal with this, were stewards. In other words, they weren't owners of what was happening. They were, they were serving another. They were not stewards. Uh, excuse me, they were not owners. They were stewards. And the interesting part to me was that all of that the Lord takes place. Because when you read the term Lord here, it's not Lord in the sense of capital L that they were talking to Jesus. But the parable he's giving them is a very earthly, relevant parable of something that's happening in natural earthly terms and hear me and this is so important that if I were to ask you this question and put it in two different ways and say how many of you feel like you're faithful to the Lord all of it you know people just automatically they're faithful to the Lord despite the fact they may not be faithful in the earthly representations or the natural representations of what goes on in their life because we have the ability because the Lord is obviously spirit the Lord the Lord isn't in front of us, flesh and blood. And so we, we, we think we snow him because we can, we can kind of cultivate our own ideas and then we just lay it on him. And so we can be good because we've just laid some ideas on him when in actuality we've not understood what this is all about and not understood that a lot of times God watches the natural happenings in our life in order to equate that to how you are serving or relating to the Lord. Are you following me? Well, he said, this is what he said. Here's how he said it in the scripture. If you can't be faithful in that which is another man's, why would you be given that which is your own? That, that's how Jesus put it. He's saying, I'm not giving you anything unless you're faithful with what you've got. And, you know, I've preached this before. Why would God, you know, why would, why would God give you, I've said for years, why would God throw the keys to the governments of the world, to the church. Why would he throw us the keys and say, you drive, you drive this globe when a lot of times we'll fuss over colors of carpet and other menial, silly things and then we think we're going to rule the world. Most, you know, we have, we have Christian men who can't take dominion over their eyes. Why do we think they could take dominion over nations? We've got presidential candidates who we venerate now, who've been married three, four, five times, dumping one woman for another woman, and they can't, they can't, they can't rule in a simple marriage, and yet we're going to throw them the keys to America. How dumb are we? Yeah. Oh, but we'll do it because we don't think these ways anymore. And so we've got to understand that, that the natural demonstrates what spiritual reality is, all right? And so I, I brought a list here that I want to uh, just share with you on several things that I just thought was, was good. And, and I think I want to tell a little story in here. I've got notes every which way. I've got arrows and notes and things all over here. So. But there are five things that I want to suggest to you that faithful service looks like. And we'll go through this quickly. 
Five quick things. Number one is this. He says they're trustworthy. They're trustworthy. It says in verse 14, it says, it's like a man who called his servants and delivered his goods to them. In other words, he gave them, this, this employer, this master, this owner, gives these stewards literally his money. Now, he had, he had to trust him. How many of you know if you're going to give people some money, and talents were actually were, were a lot more money than people think. And, and if someone gives you money and says, here, I want you to handle my money, I mean, you, you, I would think you would trust them, wouldn't you? So he knows they're trustworthy. He was able to trust them with important things. Uh, and you know what? Unless you can handle and be trustworthy with important things, you've not been faithful. So to access the promises of the kingdom, there is a trust factor. And it's not so much do you trust the Lord, but can the Lord trust you? Can the Lord give you important things that are important to him? We've said this for years. You know, Jesus affirms children. It's amazing. Can you be, it's not will you work? in the nursery, can we trust you there? Because it's way more important than you think it is. Amen. I'm preaching good now, man. It's, I feel an anointing coming right now. All right, trustworthiness. Can the Lord trust you if he gives you even small things? Can he trust you with it? If he hands these things to you, trustworthiness, that's a part of being faithful. Number two is integrity. Integrity in verse 15, he says he gives them five talents, two talents, and another one, each according to his own ability, and then immediately he goes on a journey. And so, so he believes that if he gives them these talents, that they have the integrity to deal with them well. In other words, he will eventually come back, and he knows that when he comes back and he asks about his money, they're not going to say, what money? They have an integrity. Integrity means literally means to be whole or to be integrated. It means that you can be left alone because who you are in public is who you are in private. It's the confidence to know that what you say and present with your life is really who you are. That's integrity. Integrity is your words match your life. Your life is the same as what you see and what's behind the scenes. That's integrity. You can trust me, and you can trust that, that to the best of my ability, I will handle it as well as I can. Number three, being faithful is this. It's consistency. Consistency. I can't read all these verses again, verses 16 through 18. Uh, it talks about uh, him giving these talents, and then they begin to work with these talents. And if you go into verse 19, just the first phrase in verse 19, it says this, after a long time, the Lord returns. Now, here's, here's an important point. Faithfulness has no time limit. There's no buzzer to stop you in your faithfulness. I, I, you need to remember that Joseph had to be faithful when he was sold into slavery. He worked in Potiphar's house and got an unjust deal. When he was put into prison, he was faithful there. You understand, faithfulness isn't, I'm only going to be faithful until it doesn't go my way. I'm only going to be faithful until it gets hard. I'm only going to be faithful until there's nothing in it for me anymore. I'm only going to be faithful until, you know, it, it makes sense to me. That's not how faithful works. Faithful has no time limit associated with it. I mean, John the Baptist was in the wilderness for over a decade before God released him to a ministry that he ultimately lost his head over. How'd you like to be used by God in that regard? I mean, there are times and seasons, I get it, but... But Moses, Moses was faithful for 40 years before God released him to go do the big thing. Paul had at least seven years, I think, in the house of Ananias. Noah spent over 40 years working on that ark. Can you imagine that? Faithful has no time limit. From the moment I say yes to Jesus to the moment I die, I am faithful. Faithful. Faithful's big. Faithful to my wife. I'm faithful. The tough day, sure there are. Just ask her. She's never wanted to divorce me. She's wanted to shoot me a time or two, but she's never wanted to divorce me. It's consistency. No time limit. Number four is accountability. Again, it says, after a long time, he came and he settled accounts with them. A faithful person can be corrected and kept accountable. 
Now, the reason the American church, I think, is in decline and can no longer be called faithful is because it refuses to be corrected and accountable. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It's really hard. Now, people, people will still take some rugged preaching as long as, as long as you don't shave them. But, I mean, just try it. Just try correcting somebody sometime in a church. Just try it. You can't hardly do it anymore. You can't do it. And I've got no, there's no love loss for public school with me, by the way. But can, I couldn't even imagine being a public school teacher today. Because the first thing every parent thinks is, it's, it's, it's my, little, my little five-year-old, Johnny, is smarter than 50-year-old teacher. And I'm not saying every 50-year-old teacher is always right, but I am saying that five-year-old Johnny does not have the aggregate wisdom of the universe resting inside of him. <laughs> but just try it. Just try just something simple like that. I, I was telling Dr. Ron I have a blog that I'm getting ready to write, and I've just kind of been mulling over it, but, but it's entitled The Crybaby Nation. <laughs> the Crybaby Nation. We are a bunch of crybabies. We are a bunch of whiners. Not winos, whiners. Whiners. We whine. I know we look at the world and we say it all the time, but listen, I, I'm done pointing my finger at the world. Judgment starts first at the house of God, the scripture says, and we whine as much in the house as we do outside the house. We're, we, we live as entitled in the house as they do out there. And we've got to begin to understand that if we're going to be called faithful in the era we're living in, God's about ready to sift us in a way we've never been sifted, and we're going to figure this out. And there's an accountability to it. I mean, just the master came and settled accounts. Can, can, can you be held accountable? I mean, pastors are frightened to confront people because they just can't handle any accountability. So what we do is we just don't say anything hoping it gets better, and then everybody does what's right in their own eyes, and that's why there's anarchy, and that's why the American church is where it's at. And I understand there are believers who are just as concerned as we are about the state of the nation, but the reason pastors are afraid of giving direction to the state of the nation is because the minute we touch their sin, see ya, I'm being led somewhere else. We're not being faithful. We're going to need faithful servants, faithful people in the era that you and I are living in. And finally, number five, then I want to tell a story and then we'll be done, is responsibility. Responsibility. In verses 24 and 25, when he finally gets to the one talent person who did nothing with it, he begins to do several things. In fact, I think he did two things, this unfaithful servant that stood out to me. Number one is, was this, he blame shifted. When, when, the, when the master came to him, this is what he said. He said, I didn't do anything with it. Well, why didn't you do anything with it? He said, well, because I knew, I knew you. You're a hard guy. I, I know your reputation. I know, I, I know. See, he never owned it. He blame shifted. It's not my fault. It's your fault. It's not that I dropped the ball. It's your fault. He wouldn't own it. He wouldn't be responsible. And interestingly enough, what else I find in here is the guy never said he was sorry. Isn't that? I mean, sometimes the things you see omitted are as revelational as the things that are there. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I know I dropped the ball here, but it's your fault, and I'm not even going to say I'm sorry about it. <laughs> Have mercy. A faithful person takes responsibility for their life, their actions, their attitudes, their responses. You can tell a lot about a person who can't say, I'm sorry. Now, I'll just tell you, I can preach here because that was me for years. It really was. I had a really hard time. Amen, honey? Isn't that true? Uh, yeah, amen. Even she's going, and even today, there's days that he's... No, I know. I mean, it's hard. It's hard. I'm better. I'm better. But why can't you say, I'm sorry? i tell you why. It's pride. It's arrogance. It's the inability to be corralled. It's not wanting to humble yourself. This isn't, this isn't you know, it's rocket science. Conversely, you can measure a person's character who can say without forcing them, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And that's just the list for a faithful, faithful servant. 
I want to tell you a story, and then we're going to pray. I just thought of this. Really, I thought of this this morning. It should have dawned on me earlier. But I remember those years. And this is going to be real personal, folks, so just buckle up, okay? I'm going to make a personal story that's going to touch us, probably, in a challenging way. But I want it to. When I was a staff pastor at Evangel Cathedral, late 80s through the mid-90s, Pastor Miles was getting up into years. In fact, I'm getting to his age area that he was then. And God began to do something in him. And I'll never forget the day he stood up in front of the congregation and he, and he said, the fields are white unto harvest. And he began, to, he began to pitch the vision for Russia and reaching Russia. And that was great. I mean, everybody's for missions. I mean, who would, who's, who's against missions? But what we didn't realize was is that that was what his calling was going to be. And hear me when I say this, it was, it was the most unusual temple, uh, template because Pastor Miles, really, we used to kid him about having really three full-time jobs. He was the pastor of this church that I was at. He was the bishop over a fellowship of over 300 churches. 300 churches, think about that. 300 churches. A church of 300 people is a significant work. 300 churches. And he was going to Russia once... The Iron Curtain fell in order to start churches there, and he was going eight times a year, listen, for at least two to three weeks at a time. Now, I, I never thought of this until I was just today. And I, I'll never forget, because that meant, I remember one year, he was not there for 32 weeks. I'd forgotten this. He was not there for 32 weeks. And there were people... <laughs> I'm just telling you, there are people that would come up to us. You say, well, what happened? Well, there was, there was staff. There were other people there that were, that were preaching and, and functioning and pastoring and doing that. He was still the pastor now, but there were other people that were doing that, me being one of them. I was 32 years old. And my, my slice of that pie was is that I was to watch ostensibly the fellowship of 300 churches. Can you imagine a 32-year-old doing that? That should have been illegal. Probably was in several states. <laughs> But listen to me, we had people that would come to me and go, why is he in Russia? Winning souls? Well, he should be with, here with me. Really? <laughs> really? You don't think that we can't get more done working under a, a, a temple like this? I remember these conversations. Totally, totally forgotten these conversations. There are people that walked because I, I can't have pastor anymore. And they, and they walked. Well, here's what God did, though. This is what God did. He grew it to the greatest size it had ever been. Because those who had a heart in it, those who could see it, those who understood the kingdom, those who understood that God was beginning to enlarge and expand and, 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 and they weren't selfish about it and they could release and they understood that they had a piece of it. Listen to me when I tell you this, God did an amazing things. Those were the best years. I've even talked to him now. He's in his, his late 80s now and I talked to him and he looked at me and said, Kevin, those were the best years we ever had is when we were doing all those things like that. And, and yeah, there were people that couldn't get it because you, see, because, you see, they could never switch from carnal culture to kingdom culture. Now, I know that's straight shooting, and I know our template here is a little bit different because you don't see me all the time. And I can say generally, from what I've heard, everybody's been generally positive, but I'm not so naive to think that that may always be the case, except to say this that I would rather give my life doing something great and going for something great and trying something new and living out of the box and trying a different template and doing something out of the box. I would rather do that with potential failure than to live my life in the regret of wondering what if. And, and some of you can make direct application to your own life. That the reason you're where you are now is because the comfort of where you are now feels, feels better than the risk of just trying something new and believing God. Amen. Hear my heart. I love you guys. You don't know how much I love Charleston, how much I think of you. When I saw that prophecy that took place, I thought, oh, Lord, we need to speak to that. Listen, listen, I think of you and I love you, but hear me when I say this. You heard the word of the Lord. 
from in our church in 2004, which said this. They use the term reformation. Your pastor will go and be a voice to the nation in reformation. We didn't even use that terminology. He will go and come and he will go and come and he will go and come. And he told us, he told you, he said, don't sink your claws into him because if you do what you have will dry up and wither. But if you will release, God will do something incredibly great. And that's what I want to see. And I guess I'm just so simple to believe his word. Release the